Welcome to the section on piles, bearing, and friction for the Structure Inspection Level 1 class. As you can see from the diagram below, KYTC wants all bridges found on solid rock. As you can see from the picture above, a structure that is built on piling is supported on rock and will not move. If you have a structure without piling, say here with just a pier that is on an indent or a pier that's on a footing, there could is a risk of the footing settling which would then cause the entire bridge to settle and could result in catastrophic failure. So therefore as a cabinet we have made the position to put all bridge on piling or founded directly on solid rock. There are different types and uses of piling. For the majority of the state we use point bearing piles. That's where rock is fairly shallow um, but could be a little deep. But where it gets the name point bearing is the end of the pile bears directly on solid rock. There is no friction that's taken into account. Uh, most of the time these are steel H sections, either 12 inch or 14 inch piles. Uh, but if you get along the river and far western Kentucky you're going to see more friction piles. These can either be H piles or circular pipe piles. Uh, there is no solid rock to set the bridge on. The pile actually develops bearing due to side friction. For an example on the Kentucky Lake Bridge rock was 400 foot deep so we had to drive uh, six foot diameter pipe piles around 180 foot to get set up which was caused when you got enough friction to keep the pile from moving anymore. Uh, so that's just kind of the difference. Friction piles use friction to hold them in place while point bearing piles to bear directly on solid rock. There's a third kind of piles we're kind of using more and more called micro piles. These are generally a steel casing with a high strength reinforcing bar that has then filled with grout. So they drill the hole, put the casing in, put the bar in that, and then backfill the entire void that is created with grout. This can either be a 6 and 12 inch in diameter. Uh, if you've never seen this before, but you have seen, say, soil nail launching, a soil nail job, very similar aspect, just different materials. So with point bearing piles, there is some design limitations, or just piles in general. You must have at least 10 foot of piling in original ground. If you're not going to get 10 foot in original ground, you've got to pre-drill to make sure your hole is deep enough to get at least 10 foot. Also, you must have at least 10 foot below stream bed. This is just due to scour. We want to make sure the piles are down far enough. In all instances, if you can't get that 10 foot, you're going to have to pre-drill. Uh, you can see the note below. It is pulled directly from a set of plans. It is talking about the different case that piling must be driven to. As you can see right here with the laser, it has to have a half inch or less for 10 consecutive blows. And then practical refusal is obtained after the pile is struck an additional 10 blows. And it doesn't move a half inch. So that's the way we're going now. No more of filling out the charts. No more calculating bearing. It's drive it till it won't move half inch. Strike it 10 times. See if it moved less than a half inch. Also part of the driving criteria is we want the contractor to use a certain uh, pile hammer. As you can see on this slide, they got to have a hammer with a rated energy between 16 and 35 kip feet. Uh, the contractor needs to submit to you that before they start construction. They will submit a hammer that says this hammer is rated, say, for 25 kip foot. And you, as the inspector or the engineer, would look at that and go, yes, it's between 16 and 35. Therefore, it is approved. Your role then, as the inspector, is to make sure that they're operating the hammer at the same guidelines as it was rated at. So I talked earlier about 10 blows and a half inch. That's case class two, as you can see here. That's the different classes we're going to for practical refusal based on the rock that you're in. Uh, you will see these noted. These are in the new spec book in section 604. Uh, you will see in your plans, it would actually call out which class. So if it doesn't say in your plans what class it is, it might just say class two. You would then have to go back to 604, the spec book, to look that up. You have to stop driving if any visible yielding of the pile occurs. If you see it yielding, stop right then and see what's going on. Uh, check any specifications in your guidance manual for that. For friction piles, we use two of the methods, the dynamic testing or the gates method. The dynamic testing is done when the subcontractor comes in and actually hooks instrumentation up to the machine and tests it. The gates method is a spreadsheet that is used and that is calculated uh, friction based on that.
Pile design orientation is key. Remember when I talked earlier in the session on bridge components, we talked about integral indents and indents. An integral indent takes the movement of the bridge, and it takes the movement of the bridge because the piling is in the weak axis. So as you can see here where it says weak axis, the piling is in the configuration looking like an H. In the strong axis, the configuration looks like an I. I want you to think of a two by six piece of wood. If you take a two by six piece of wood and lay it flat where the six inch part is facing up and try to walk on it, it's gonna have a pretty good deflection if it's just supported on the ends. But if you take that piece of wood and stand it up straight and try to walk on it, it is not gonna deflect because that is its strong axis. Piling is the same way. If the piling is in the straight direction from where the movement's gonna go, so the forces of movement are going this way, so therefore that piling is going to be stronger to resist that movement. Whereas here is in the weak axis, think of that two by six laying flat, can move back and forth. This is important for the bridge to function. So you'll see this is brought out of a set of plans, a view of an indent, an ingrow indent, because you can see the piling right here is labeled as an H or in the weak axis. If these are put in the wrong axis, there will be failure in the bridge. It's not catastrophic, but you will start to see concrete crack because if it's supposed to move and the piling won't let it move, it is going to find a way to release that stress. Now here's a set of plans where you can just see there's a lot on here, but if I can kind of zoom in, you can see the different piling. Here, every pile is numbered, and with that number, there is a chart that you have to fill out as well, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And there are battered piles, which is piles that are in a angled. Here's another one. I just like this one because you can see there is piling in the pier footers as well as piling in the indent. And note that the piling on this drawing in the pier right here is in the strong axis but the piling in the indent is in the weak axis. So therefore the same. We don't have any movement over the pier. All the movement's getting taken at the integral indent. So here is where I'd said about our pile record this is critical for as-built drawings. Your role as the inspector is you need to fill this out. So you write in what your pile length in place is, and then from that you can calculate, based on the pile cutoff, what the point of the pile elevation is. We'll do another little example about that in just a little bit. Just a close-up view of that again. So here's our pile record. If you can see, we got a pile cutoff elevation of 653.446. Let's just say, for example, we had 23 foot of pile that was installed. So then you would calculate the point of pile elevation as 653.446. That's the pile cutoff elevation minus the 23 feet that is installed. That equals the point of pile elevation as driven is 650.44. I'm sorry, that is not 650. That is 630. 0.446. So that's you take the pile cutoff elevation, subtract the pile length in place from that, and that gives you the point of the pile. That's what our load raters want to know is how far that pile is at the ground. What is that bottom elevation? Most of the state you're not going to need to splice piles, but if you get into some instances where solid rock or a good rock is more than, say, 50 feet, you're going to look at sp splicing piles. This sp splice is critical because if the splice fails, your piling is going to fail. Standard drawing in your standard drawing book kind of gives you details on how to do the splices. Make sure you follow that. Make sure you follow the welds. This one here has a 5 16 inch fillet weld with the plates. There's also a bevel on one end of the pile and not the other. That's to take a weld. It's a 45 degree weld right there. So make sure as they're welding these, there's a certified welder. So you ask for their certification. That's either by the state or the American Welding Society. And make sure it is welded in, occurrence, in concordance with the standard drawing. If they don't want to take all the time of welding a splice on, they can use a steel splice. This one's called the Champion Splicer. As you can see here in the picture, it just fits on the other weld. The pile fits directly into that. They still have to do some welding, but it is a lot minimal compared to what the uh, square splice was in the previous slide. There's another picture of what is welding. You're just welding the uh, bottom flange and top flange of the pile. 
For pipe piles, the weld is spliced a little different. You have to put a backer plate in, as you can see the backer plate there. The bottom pile is still flat while the top is beveled. So with that, they must come in at a 45 degree and they fill that bevel in completely. If that weld is not correct, it's gonna take a lot of stresses during the driving and that can break. If it breaks, the pile may slip over and uh, start shearing on top of the other piles. Here's an unacceptable weld. As you can see that, they never filled it in. The top pile was not beveled. Here, this is what you're looking for. This is a piling that has been put together. You can see a good continuous weld all the way around that is built on top of itself. This is a picture of one where it failed. Geotech came down, dropped a camera down the pile, and you can actually see where the pile, uh, the splice broke, shifted over, and they just kept driving it down upon itself. If this happens, it is a contractor's responsibility to pull it and redrive a new pile. Just a picture of the backer plate that goes on. Another picture of a welded splice. So when you're pile driving, the first thing you gotta do is excavate to the bottom of the cap. You'll find that on your bridge plans. Uh, look at what uh, either embent sheet or pile, pier sheet and find the bottom of the cap elevation. You accurately lay out the piling. We can't really tell the contractor how to do that, but it's their job to accurately lay it out. Most good contractors will use a jig to where all they gotta do is put the piling right in its slot and start driving. Uh, place the leads and the pile at the correct batter if it is battered. Uh, check the batter periodically, make sure they're holding on that batter. Record all your information. If anything goes wrong, record it. Get the elevation, if there's any twist, record it. Mark each pile with chalk to keep up with what is going into the ground. Because you want it marked before it goes in so you can tell, do I got 19 feet, 22 foot, 22 foot, four inches, whatever it is, that it keeps being marked so you know that. And you'll know when you've hit rock, because the sound will change from a ping, ping to ping. It'll have a real loud, high-pitched sound when it hits rock, and you'll see that pile hammer jump. So here's a picture of pile going in. You can see here that this pile has been marked with paint, but also you can't see in the picture the chalk marks is in between. Uh, they've blazed it. This one's been driven. It's just about done. The videos weren't showing up for this, so I just skipped past those. As you can see here, this one has been marked. This is a class two, where it's a half inch and 10 blows. You can see down here, they started marking it, went 10 blows, and it moved, we'll say, three quarters of an inch. Same, three quarters of an inch all the way up, starting to tighten it up. Here is our 10 blows and a half inches. So we knew at this point, this pile has been set. Uh, they would stick a jig on top of this, a piece of metal, and then draw the line, and then count 10 blows and measure it from there. Here's a good looking jig the contractor has constructed. As you can see, they can just bring the pile in, drop it into place, and start driving. There's no wondering, am I in the right spot? There's no just X on the ground. Here's one that's on a batter. This guy is checking the batter with this level, making sure it's staying on the correct batter as it's being driven. Here you can see they've been driven. This guy's kind of coming in and just cutting them off to the correct cutoff elevation. This is a contractor did not have an accurate jig. More likely it also hit some boulders underground, which caused their piling to twist and move. Uh, we want piling driven at the correct uh, coordinates that is designed on the plans. So if you get something like this, it's a contractor's responsibility to pull this and redrive it. It may require pre-drilling to make sure that it's going in straight. This is a vibratory hammer. And you see if a contractor has two cranes on site, they can elect to do this. This is just getting all piling driven through soil. It's not gonna do anything into rock, but it gets them into place. That way as they bring the hammer on there, they can hit it, hit it, and be done. There's no wasting time driving it through soil. For batter piles, you can go to the guidance manual. There is this uh, nice chart that kind of converts pile length in place of a batter to the actual vertical dimension because you need that vertical dimension to calculate the end of the pile. So question, test piles are for the engineer's use in determining capability of the contractor's equipment and adequacy of design. True or false? It is true. As per 604, 03, 06 of the spec book, you can see highlighted in yellow, 
Test piles are for the engineer's use in determining capability of the contractor's equipment and adequacy of design. This, we just want to make sure the design's right, the contractor's equipment's right, the contractor knows how to use their equipment, the crew is trained, and all is going well. Test piles are paid at the plan quantity, unless they drive more than plan. We pay what was driven at that point. All other piling is paid as driven length. Different variations, we'll talk about these in a little bit. Uh, the pile can vary less than a quarter inch per foot from its vertical or battered position. Uh, the pile is driven less than six inches from the plane position to cut off. We've got a chart about that in a second. Like I said, if any problem occurs, pull the pile and redrive it. Now the contractor is responsible for any and all cost to correct. So here's a chart. Say your pile was driven and you drove it and you set up two inches below the cutoff elevation. Are we going to make the contractor come back and weld on a two foot, two inches piece? No, it's good. We'll just call it. If it's two inches or less, uh, we've got enough pile that's into the indent to take that action. Here's one that's been driven more than two inches. If it's anywhere from two to six, uh, the contractor has to dig down around the pile, put a form up, and encase the piling in extra concrete. Uh, if it's greater than six inches, they got to splice it. And make sure that splice is done correct because especially if that pile is in the weak direction, it's going to have a lot of force moving that back and forth. We don't want that to break. This is the modified gates equation worksheet used in friction piling. So if you have a friction pile and it does not have dynamic testing as a bid item, you got to fill this spreadsheet out. Any questions with that, contact your liaison and we'll work with Geotech to make sure uh, you, the inspector or the engineer, knows how to work this spreadsheet. So we require pile points on our piling. It is a pay item. We do it more for the reason of, you can see in this picture, we want to make sure our pile is good all the way through. You can drive through concrete pipes. We've driven through different rock ledges. Who knows, there's some areas we've probably driven through cars. We've got to make sure that piling is holding up. Pile points are usually come welded on. Uh, if they're not, it must be done by a certified welder in the field. Some other things, mud cap, if you're into some shales, we might have to put a cap on there before we even start driving. Heat numbers are required for every pile. Make sure you get the heat number. This comes off the mill test report. That heat number is kind of like the DNA of the pile. It is all the ID of it from the metals that was melted down to how it was reformed into the pile. All the testing information that came from the mill is in that. So as you see piles one, two, three, and four, if there are four different heat numbers, you need to list those in your daily work reports. Pile number one is heat number A. Pile number two is heat number B, or so on. That way we have a record of exactly what each pile is from the mill. Uh, you can have a pile cushion, or if you're in western Kentucky, we do have the new Madrid Fault that uh, controls some design. Make sure your plans specify that, and make sure you follow that in strict accordance to the plans. That is all I have for piling. Uh, thank you for listening and watching. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to having you in class one day.